after hearing Joe's confession to a man named Seligman, whom she had self-diagnosed as a nymphomaniac, and seeing that she had been beaten and anal, Seligman took her in and cared for her. As a 12-year-old, Joe says she went on a field trip to the hills. We see a young Joe relaxing in the fields by herself, in a flashback. Unexpectedly having her first orgasm, she then sees two women watching over her as she floats up. Seligman informs Joe that the women she saw were actually Babylonian prostitutes and Valeria Mussolini, wife of Roman Emperor Claudius, also known as a wild nympho, rather than different versions of the Virgin Mary. Joe insists that the women she saw were Mary herself. Joe then thinks back on the time she and her boyfriend, Jerome, were together and how long ago she suddenly stopped feeling sexually aroused. In a flashback, she tries everything, including playing with her cat, but she still doesn't feel anything. Seligman draws parallels to Zeno's paradox and then provides a rational explanation for her unfulfillment. This mathematical analysis irritates Joe, so she accuses him of downplaying the gravity of her sexuality loss. Seligman concludes by saying he can't connect to her stories because he is asexual and a virgin. He stresses that, since he doesn't have any biases, he is the ideal person to listen to her story and pass judgment on it. Years ago, Joe's body was unresponsive to sexual activity, but she and Jerome still managed to have a good time despite her lack of desire. Since Jerome moved in with her, she has also experienced domestic comfort. After a few months of careless use of birth control pills, she becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son she calls Marcel. However, Joe's lack of libidinal pleasure persists. Her nymphomania persists, and she insists that Jerome engage in extensive sexual activity daily, a demand that eventually becomes too much for him to handle. Jerome admits to Joe one day that he loves her daring spirit but can't fulfill her every want. Their intimacy in bed is important to him. However, in order to sate her hunger, Jerome suggests that she start dating other men. The following day, Joe sneaks out with Beethoven's music in her possession while pretending to be a piano teacher. She pulls over to a one-way street and takes out each spark plug. A male driver pulls up behind her shortly after and she signals for him to assist. The men who were already held up by her car's breakdown are now attempting to figure out how to fix the spark plugs correctly. This enables her to entice men even as a multitude of onlookers swarm her. Jerome and her son are waiting for Joe at home when she gets back. He tries to cover up his jealousy by punching the wall, which causes tension between them. After a span of three years, Joe and Marcel are spotted strolling through the park. She spills the beans about Jerome's absenteeism and how, upon his return, he accuses her of ignoring their child, an accusation she interprets as an attempt to mask his jealousy of her lovers. Joe continues to be dissatisfied despite her extensive sexual encounters with men. Joe overhears a group of five black men chatting in a foreign language in the park one day. From her window, she observes them and fantasizes about a sexual encounter where she cannot communicate verbally. Joe, before she asks the men if they want to bang her, she employs a translator. After that, the translator goes over to the man and comes back with a note that specifies when and where they met. In reality, it's a dirt cheap motel. Then, just as expected, the man she has feelings for enters the room, accompanied by a shorter man. Both men proceed to undress Joe, and they start arguing over who gets to suck her behind or have it vaginally. At last, she gets so attached to one guy that she climbs on top of him, much to his annoyance. The outcome is the two men getting into an argument, which annoys her. So Joe adjourns from the room. After that, Joe walks into a seemingly deserted building's waiting room. Perched serenely by her side are two ladies. A man she calls Kay emerges from a hallway as the door opens, and he surveys the other people waiting outside. When he inquires as to her identity, Joe reveals that she is aware of his profession and secretly aspires to be one of the women he encounters. After Kay turns her down, he calls another woman Madam and invites her in. Key tells Joe after Madam leaves that he doesn't think this is for her. After that, he escorts the final woman down the hall, abandoning Joe to wait alone. Joe is still waiting in the hallway when Kay returns at a later time. As he strikes her in the face, 
he then tells her to remain motionless. Then, with all her might, Kay smacks her. After he smacks her again, Jo pauses for a while to gather herself. In the end, Kay lets her join, but he still won't sleep with her no matter what. There is no shield word for them. Ignoring her words, he will continue. His third rule is subsequently laid out. She has to be patient between two and six in the morning if she wishes to join. Jo confides in him about her inability to leave her child in the care of her unreliable babysitter. Still, Kay starts to leave. Jo hires a babysitter to watch Marcel a few days later. After some time, Kay takes her to the back room since the chair is too tiny for her. Instead, Jo is made to lean over an old couch by Kay. She rolls onto her side on her belly and, securely fastening a seatbelt around her waist, he fastens her in. Still, he instructs her to come back on Thursday and does nothing further a few moments later. Joe scolds the babysitter for not showing up on Thursday when she calls her answering machine. And upon further reflection, so that she can go to her appointment with Kay, Joe leaves her sleeping toddler alone at home. The man rebinds her and buckles the seatbelt around her waist this time. Even if Joe yells at him, he will hit her anyway, and nobody will listen to her down there. After Joe whimpers in agony, he ends the session by smacking her twelve times. As Joe bids him farewell, Kay assures her that she is more than welcome to stay. Joe leaves her young son in his crib at home alone because she gets addicted to interacting with Kay. Marcel, who is three years old, wakes up one evening while playing with Kay because she hears a snowplow outside. Crawling out of his crib, he quickly makes his way to the balcony. When Jerome gets home later, he sees his son playing unattended on the balcony. Afterwards, we see Joe and Jerome relaxing in front of the fire. Inquiring about her intentions to depart tonight, he ponders whether she loves him. Despite Joe's assurances that she has no plans to leave, he accuses her of deceiving him. Jerome has promised her that she will never see Marcel or himself again if she leaves tonight. Joe has mixed feelings about leaving that night to meet with Kay. Jerome notes this and remarks that she isn't a mother, leading him to speculate that she may be saying goodbye. Marcel is startled and begins to sob as she reaches out to Joe for comfort. Joe still leaves the house on Christmas, so Jerome tries to sway her by bringing that up. Additionally, she finds out that Jerome and Marcel have left in the present after she gets back from her appointment with Kay. After Jerome too decided he couldn't give his life to a child, Joe tells Seligman that he found a foster family in rural England to take in Marcel. The £1,000 that she secretly transfers to her son's account every month is the sole contact they have. Joe goes on to describe how she was compelled to go to therapy for her affair addiction. Her boss made her go to counselling or face termination because her new job is abuzz with rumours about her. Joe says that she became pregnant after leaving Jerome and Marcel, which is why she hates therapy. She begs her doctor to end the 11-week pregnancy, but he wants her to see a therapist first. The session with the therapist is a colossal failure due to Joe's mindset. She decides to have the abortion done herself since she has no other choice. Joe recalls that she had an abortion using a wire hanger and a number of common household objects because during her time as a medical student. Following her reluctance to attend the meetings, Joe purges her apartment of nearly all possessions in an effort to better herself. During one of her meetings three weeks later, she sees a reflection of her younger self in the mirror. Afterwards, she proceeds to insult the therapist as well as the rest of the group. Joe claims she differs from them because she is proud of her nymphomaniac tendencies. Because of her disgusting lust and love of her body, she knows she doesn't belong in regular society. When Joe meets Elle, he brings her into the world of organized crime. Her extensive understanding of men, sex, and sadomasochism is then put to use in her job as a debt collector. Despite her initial astonishment at the man's sexual readability, she remembers a memorable house call. He seems unfazed as his goons destroy a number of his possessions. Joe removes his pants and experiments with various scenarios to find his sexual stimulation, including sadomasochism, homosexuality, and more. Nevertheless, he remains unresponsive. 
In her last attempt, she recounts a tale of a young boy playing on the playground who, upon seeing him, sits down on his lap and politely requests to accompany him home. This causes the man's erection to worsen, and he decides to pay her to stop in the end. After that, Joe feels bad for him and gives him a fellatio. What makes Seligman feel sorry for a paedophile is unclear to her at this point in time. A person born with a prohibited sexuality is someone Joe feels deeply sorry for, and she shares this with Seligman. She feels bad for the man because of his sexual outcast status and loneliness, but she respects him for ignoring his unreasonable wants. Joe is able to make larger anonymous deposits to Marcel after a few years as her debt collecting business expands. Elle suggests that Joe groom P, the 15 year old daughter of criminals, as her successor one day. Joe feels bad for the girl at first, but she ends up feeling sorry for her in the end. Joe becomes P.S. anchor in her life despite P.S. frailty, loneliness, and emotional scars. Because of the bond they share, their relationship is unique. When P.E. turns 18, Joe invites her to move in with her after warming her heart. Eventually, as P.E. seems to grow up, the Joe in Peace connection takes on a more sexual tone and turns into a romance. Joe reluctantly begins to explain the INS and outs of her business to her young lover. P has joined forces with Joe and her two goons, but she storms up to the victim, brandishes a gun, and makes Joe yell at her. The name Jerome Morris was visible on the door of the debtor's house as Joe P E walked up to it, which seemed like a strange coincidence. Joe suggests that P E handle this one on his own because she is shocked. To P E, she reveals that. There should be no harm or injury done, she should simply appear and propose a reasonable payment plan to him. After that, the girl and her two goons ring the doorbell and enter. The truth about Jerome's six-part loan repayment plan is now exposed by Joe. His visits to his house for collections always make her feel uneasy and agitated. P skips the goodbye kiss with Joe on the night of the final payment, but he does it moments later. As time goes on, her doubts grow. When Joe sees a car headlight outside her window, she immediately goes to bed, certain that P.E. will materialize. At long last, Joe gets to Jerome's house, and peered out the window, she sees the two goons dozing off in a parked car. Suddenly, she sees Jerome skulking up behind her to give her an embrace as well as a nude P.E. in the kitchen. Joe retrieves the firearm she had taken from P.E. the night after and puts it away in the closet. Joe points her gun and pulls the trigger as she walks straight past her as she turns around in the alley. She stops when she sees Jerome and P kissing Jerome. But that's all that occurs. She gives it another go, but eventually it clicks. Joe is brutally assaulted by Jerome, who stands by silently. After that, P.E. and Jerome have an intimate encounter in front of Joe, during which the girl urinates on her. Jerome then leaves. In the here and now, Seligman finds her in the middle of it and brings her home. Joe admits to Seligman that she is still baffled as to why the gun was ineffective. After removing the safety, she made sure the gun was empty of ammunition. According to Seligman, the sliding mechanism must be pulled and released in order to fire a Walter PPK. Joe acknowledges his point and mentions that she has watched it numerous times in movies. Shortly after, Seligman realizes that the sun is rising and that it is dawn. Therefore, he advises Joe to take a nap before she goes to sleep. After Seligman listened to Joe's story, she felt better, and she thanks him for it. Additionally, she expresses her gratitude to him for becoming her most recent and, conceivably, her very first friend. In addition, Joe expresses her relief that the gunshot did not result in her being charged with murder. Seligman inquires as to whether Joe intends to get in touch with Marcel. She does concede that it's possible. After saying their goodbyes, she shuts the door behind them. Just a few moments after that, Seligman comes back to the dimly lit room while undressed. He proceeds to try to attack her, but she rejects him. Since she has slept with thousands of guys, he tries to persuade her that it is irrelevant. Nonetheless, Joe fires a gun at him. She quickly gets dressed and bolts from the apartment. To see more videos like this, subscribe and enable notifications if you enjoyed it. All eyes are on you now.